tragedy of Jeremiah's death. Um, we've heard from Stephen Assert in brief time, you know, some of the mechanisms by how these things work, how they get recruited, and to start on how they get kept in these groups. Um, what I want to talk about today is, you know, how this knowledge is still inaccessible to most people how we can begin to think about disseminating this really important knowledge. Um, just briefly, I'm a social psychologist. I specialize in the area of cults and brainwashing, totalitarianism. I'm a part-time lecturer at Birkbeck um, and a couple other places where I teach, including uh, Mary Ward. Um, I've taught courses on cults and totalitarianism now for over 10 years. And I, that's a nice symmetry. I spent 10 years doing my field work uh, as a member of a, quote, left-wing political cult um, when I was young. Um, I have a book, if someone bought the book, it's sort of out of print, but it's on Kindle, they could hold it up. But anyway, I have a book called Inside Out, which is a memoir of that experience. Um, so I'm trying to kind of propose a little different approach to prevention of extremism than it is currently underway in this country. I want to just start by telling a story. Um, I was a visiting lecturer at Westminster University just up the road here from 2007 to 2012. And when the story about Jihadi John, um, his real name, Mohammed M. Zali, who did the beheading that we I'm sure all have heard about, when that story came out, I was shocked but not surprised to find he'd been at Westminster University during the time when I was teaching there. And I wasn't surprised because I saw a tremendous amount of recruiting going on. Um, I had female students approach me, Muslim students, saying they were being pressured in the ladies' toilets to cover up their hair and wear the veil. Um, I went to some of the uh, lectures by the Global Idea Society or the ISMA Society or whatever the front group was called at that time that um, would be about, for instance, one was about does God exist, where you would have a wonderfully charismatic speaker um, explaining these great ideas and a hapless sociology professor trying to argue the ideas and talk about enlightenment principles. The sociology professor lost this debate. I mean, it was kind of pathetic because they didn't have the charisma, they weren't young, so on and so forth. Um, there were, one of these lectures, uh, well, women were encouraged to sit at the back. This is at Westminster University in their auditorium, okay? Women are encouraged to sit at the back. Um, at the doorway, which was about the size of these doorways, two, after everyone was in, two burly chaps would stand on either side of the doorway. So it was very intimidating should you want to leave. Um, and I think I was the only person who went and said, you know, i her off. <laughs> um, during that time, I tried to raise this with the administration. I tried to say, let's put on some programs. I actually got over a lot of objections, speakers from Quilliam, which is an anti-Islamic extremist organization to come and speak. Interestingly, the administration tried to shut us down while letting <laughs> the recruiters in. Um, so, you know, basically, I, I felt terrible because these students were being led like lambs to the slaughter. Nobody was really stepping up to try to protect them. Um, so, you know, th though that example is about Muslim extremists, you know, we know that there are a lot of other groups of varying ideologies um, recruiting in our, on our campuses and in, in our communities. Um, and but I particularly wanted to bring up that example because it was such a direct example of this head in the sand approach. That if we ignore it, it will go away. And the fear of confronting these processes that are going on. And by the way, as we sit here, you know, we're in right near London University land, right? And it's going on right now. I walk around to UCL putting posters off of the extremist groups, right? Um, so I want to talk about a, a different way of looking at this, um, a method that's grounded in solid research. It's ideologically <coughs> neutral. We don't need to point the finger at any particular belief system. 
It does not undermine what we talk a lot about in this country, social cohesion efforts. We know, I think, that some of the work by the government that prevent program tends to end up pointing the finger at Muslim communities and is actually having a bit of a backlash, is alienating those communities. Um, so this approach is trying to get around that and it requires getting a prevention much earlier in the process before people are recruited, before they even approach. Um, it's a public health model, I like to think, based on education <coughs> to create an institution and community-wide culture of awareness and knowledge. Um, I know in particular that I think Steve shares this approach or this view. Um, I wanted to, the key message really is that knowledge is the key to prevention. Um, as everyone said, we have a lack of time, so I can only briefly go over this. But people have been studying this problem since the Holocaust in great depth. Um, this isn't new. We've been here over 70 years of knowledge. And I just want to give a very brief overview. This is a kind of crude division into four phases, and it doesn't totally work, but it's a way to get across this information. Um, so we had in the from the 30s to the 60s, scholars such as Steve has mentioned, Solomon Ash was brilliant on this stuff. Um, I put here uh, Milgram, who did the obedience studies. I think Hannah Arendt belongs in this group, and various others. And this was really trying to answer the question of how did good Germans engage in the genocide. Okay. Um, the next group was also mentioned by Steve. It's the people like Robert J. Lifton. Margaret Singer, who studied the brainwashed um, former prisoners of war and others who came out of China and North Korea, and tried to ask the question, how did these kind of ordinary Westerners and others just come out with a completely different ideology after this experience? Um, and they're very fundamental in Celtic studies, certainly, of this group. Um, then we had um, people like Zimbardo who was there for the experiment, um, various others, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. But, um, and then I think from the 80s on, we had people like a lot of the people who've been presenting today along in this group. People who had the experience of being in a cult, um, and have written memoirs, and then tried to um, theoretically understand that experience. Uh, I also think in this group we have now the scholars of terrorism. Uh, Jessica Stern has written and, uh, her new book about ISIS has just come out, I think. Um, Martha Crenshaw is one of the early scholars of terrorism. And they're starting to see, I think, some of our work as being useful. So this work on terrorism and radicalization is sort of starting, I think, to merge with the work on cults and brainwashing. And I think it's about time it did. Um, the primary message of most of these scholars is that knowledge of the methods and structures of these totalitarian or extremist or cultic systems is key to prevention. It's key because of these systems operate based on our universal human responses that we all have to certain situational and group pressures. Um, and it's only once we can understand those uh, responses that we can begin to resist them and protect ourselves against them. Um, so, Solomon Ash, who's really one of my main heroes, along with Hannah Aaron, um, says, the greater man's ignorance of the principles of his social surroundings, the more subject is he to their control. The greater his knowledge of their operations <coughs> and of their necessary consequences, the freer he can become with regard to them. If I know that someone standing in the doorway is there to intimidate me, I can get up and tell them to move, because I understand what that means. Um, Lifton talked about, and I quote, the acquisition of a sense of understanding, a theory about what is going on, an awareness of being manipulated and awareness of being manipulated is what helped people in the prisoner of war camps resist the brainwashing. Uh, Zimbardo talks 
who also talks about a few tried to use public health models, talks about knowledge of how these influence settings work, what you can do to resist them, the first step in becoming a wiser <coughs> consumer of social influence. Many others say similar things, you can see. Um, this isn't a new thought, okay? This goes back again until after World War II. And I've been looking for a quote for a while, and I think I found one. Um, but after, and if anyone knows a better quote, I'd like it. <laughs> but after the war, education about totalitarianism was imposed on the German education system by the Allies, for obvious reasons, okay? And in 1962, um, this was supplemented by additional guidelines that said teachers working in all the different kinds of schools were urged to, quote, familiarize pupils with the characteristics of totalitarianism, the main features of Bolshevism and Nazism. Now, I think some of this is still going on, despite the failures of justice in Jeremiah's case. When I had German students in my classes, they already know a lot of what I'm teaching. Um, and nobody else does. Everybody else is like, hey, how come I haven't heard this before? Right? This is valuable information. So I'm not really using Germany as a model. I'm just saying it's interesting, the history of these guidelines. Um, okay. I hope I'm not going too fast and worried about time. Um, uh, so what we're seeing now is, you know, International politicians, Obama, Cameron, nearly every journalist now, is now using the words cults and brainwashing to describe ISIS, right? They're becoming now kind of rehabilitated, these words, after having been uh, excluded from our vocabulary by certain academics, who I will name if you want me to. <laughs> um, and I think it's accurate. First of all, people have a popular understanding of those words. We kind of know, we may not have all the analysis, but we kind of know what they mean. And these, ISIS is a cult, as we've already discussed. Um, and I think it's important because using this, these terminologies gives us access to the set of knowledge that I previously showed that we can use to start educating people as a prevention method. And of course, a small cult, once it becomes a bigger group and wants to seize state power, and then becomes a totalitarian movement, once it seizes state power, it's a totalitarian state. These, you know, they, they're different sizes and forms, but they all have the same mechanisms and dynamics. Okay. Before I talk a bit about what we need to be doing, I just want to step back and look at what isn't working well, isn't supported by the evidence. Um, pre the PREVENT program, unfortunately, has been doing a lot of this profiling, trying to identify vulnerable individuals, <coughs> vulnerable communities. We know this isn't good. First of all, we know we can't profile. Um, there are many studies that say, I mean, what's, what have we got in common apart from we're getting a bit gray? You know. We're smart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and <laughs> Um, the latest piece that came out um, was around the corner here, the International Center for the Study of Radicalization at King's College has said there's no reliable socio-demographic profile of, in this case, jihadists, okay? And <coughs> Margaret Singer and other experts agree. Um, and we can see from the sad example of those young teenage girls from the East End, you know, each time we get a new case, we have to expand our view of the vulnerable Individual, individual till it becomes useless. Um, people become as much recruited to totalitarian organizations as Martha Crenshaw said, by accident. They're on, usually on their way to other goals and they have the bad misfortune to run into one of these um, groups. And what we need to look at, according to John Morgan, another terrorist, terrorism scholar, it's not why, it's not what their motivation was, because their motivation was not to join a cult, but it's how, how they were recruited. That's what we need to look at. So we can't predict who will join, but thanks to that 70 years of scholarship, we can predict the processes. And so that's what we need to be focusing on. Um, okay, I think the second thing that doesn't work, and this is a big problem, and I, 
and dealing with academics, um, everyone thinks if we just teach critical thinking skills, we'll be okay. But these are not problems of logic. These are not problems of unpicking what's wrong in the belief system. And, I mean, it's not that that's totally irrelevant, but that's not the core. Um, these are problems of human dynamics, of pressure, of how we respond to authority, and what both Masood and Steve have just discussed. Um, okay. uh, so really our teaching, yes, critical thinking skills, but more specifically critical thinking skills about these human dynamics and about these processes is what we have to focus on and what is almost completely absent from current education, as far as I can see. Um, okay. So again, this means we have to really, um, we have to use different examples from a range of cults, small, medium, and large, up to totalitarian states such as Cambodia and Germany in the, during Hitler's regime. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting lost, but I'll come back. Um, let me just move on then. Okay, so we have, okay. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this because we've already had good description, but this is just briefly my five-point definition of a totalist system. Charismatic and authoritarian leadership, these isolating hierarchies, absolute black and white belief system, a process of brainwashing, and the outcome, if you apply this wonderful recipe, you can <coughs> have deployable followers. Um, in terms of the ideology, the first phase, the front stage phase, is really the propaganda phase, and that's where you're kind of trying to appeal to something that the person might actually care about. And it's in the second phase when they're starting to really be inside. You get the indoctrination phase, which is where the biggest lies now here. Just trying to connect back to the earlier talks. Um, my particular interest in this is the control of relationships. Uh, well, that's just a picture of health with our front groups. And I have two have a formula. Um, <laughs> and mine is that isolation of the person from their previous life and from any close relationships, plus engulfment in the new system, plus the arousal of fear, which makes people bond to that new system, gives you a control of the follower. So basically we're all saying the same thing using different words. And I say it's not the KISS principle, but it's the ITRS principle. It's the relationship, stupid. It's, it's about human relationships. Um, okay, so. Uh, just got time to say what we should do. I think we need to learn from campaigns such as the domestic violence campaign. We now sort of take it for granted that people kind of understand what domestic violence looks like and that anyone can be subject to it. That's taken 40 some years. And it started with, you know, those crazy feminists who didn't, you know, who were angry at men, you know, and they started these battered women's shelters and they fought like the blazers. And slowly, 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 it's now part of the normal discourse. Where, you know, if you go to the doctor, a good doctor will ask you, are you feeling safe at home? Right? We see posters on bus stops. Uh, now we have this new consent thing that's come in for young people. So the way I look at it, where we are, we are just trying to acknowledge the problem. And we're at that 40 years ago. And hopefully it will go faster for us. But we, we've got to start somewhere. And part of that is linking uh, academics, practitioners, former members, uh, people with money, <laughs> concerned family members, politicians. We have to create these networks of interested persons who can start pushing this stuff forward. Um, okay. Uh, I think what we need to do is create a, to create this climate of awareness and knowledge uh, in universities and and communities, obviously, not just universities. And I think we have kind of three main things to do. Principally, we have to educate young people about these dangerous, what I call dangerous relationships or dangerous situations, and how to navigate the array of things they're going to be faced with, particularly at these life transition stages, like going to university, but not just then, earlier as well. 
We need to provide resources. Who do you go to? Where do you get information? And institutions need to understand what a predatory group might look like from the outside, front stage, front view, and how to respond to them. Um, so what do we need to teach? We need to teach the warning signs. Is someone trying to isolate you? Uh, is someone promising you the moon? Uh, Etc. There's a whole bunch of them which we don't have time for. We need to teach all these classic studies, this great 70 years of work that was done. We need to teach specifically about recruitment and conversion methods, and they're a little different. People come into these systems in a whole different range of ways. It's really the conversion that's the same. It's that piece of getting the person fully under their control that's the universal. So what do these systems look like? What should you do? How do you protect yourself? Um, Kathleen Taylor from Oxford wrote a book called Brainwashing. She's got this idea that we need to teach young people, all of us, how to stop and think. I'm in this situation, take a minute, try to figure out what's going on. Don't just go with the flow. Anyway, there's lots of these various things. How are we going to, where and how do we get this out? I think the universities have a huge role, an absolutely huge role, because they're kind of the center of our educational system. And these are just some ideas, you know, at induction, we need undergraduate and graduate courses, required modules, sections of other modules. You can slide this information in to a whole bunch of different kind of topics. And there's a reprint of an article I have called Aren't You Into? You know, under the Influence that has some of these things in it that was on the table. You can invite speakers. We will come and speak, right, Masood? We'll go speak anywhere. Um, <laughs> you can have film series. There's great films that you can use as talking points. Uh, you can have peer mentoring. Same kinds of things can be used in schools. In communities, we know we have to educate social workers and teachers and so forth. The critical need, the gap here, is we need to train the trainers. There are too few of us experts. And we want people who want to learn from us, and particularly young people. Please, I'm just getting a bit brave. Um, okay. Uh, so I think I'm kind of there. I know, you know, I don't want to be too idealistic and Pollyannaish. That's one thing I learned from being a cult. Um, <laughs> but we need a major cultural shift, and we've got to start somewhere. And I think this shift is away from the vulnerability of the individual and even of the community. Um, instead, we've got to identify the recruiters and the organizations. That's what we've got to shine the spotlight on. And recruiters across the ideological spectrum, from Islamists to right-wing races to yoga teachers. I have a ton of clients coming out of yoga cults, to Christian, the exclusive brethren, and yeah, there's tons of these groups, so we really have to be ideologically neutral. And um, we've got to kind of turn the current model upside down. We have to empower the public to recognize these practices and learn how to protect themselves. So where do we begin? I think we begin where we are. I think we need to push to establish pilot educational programs in our own institutions and in our own communities. And we need to start to demonstrate what needs to be done. 